we are now going to try to calculate this probability. In the prior video, I discussed what we're trying to do here. So we need to convert our A1 ket state to a bra state. And I've written that here. Remember, we're not introducing any time dependence. This is just the eigenstate of our operator. And then we need to remember to take that ion complex conjugate it. For psi, what we actually need to do here is introduce that time dependence. And so if you think back to our general energy states, we always had like the Cn of time equals zero. Well, that's literally one over square root of two. And then we just introduce this time dependence term. So whenever you want to take an initial state and introduce time dependence, it has to be in the energy basis. Cool, it already is. And then we just stick that e to the negative i e1t over h bar, and then for e2. And so we keep those coefficients the same. So now we are going to start our probability measurement. And so keep in mind that we have this magnitude squared on the very outside. So I need to just copy down these two things. I'm not going to try to do all of this in my head and get it correct. And remember to be copying down your bra state, which is why I always like writing that out first. If you wanted to do this in matrix notation, you could. Um, okay, and then we have our psi of t. And again, you need to actually bring down the time dependence. You can't calculate your initial probability and then add time dependence later. You need to introduce time dependence from the beginning. You want to write it this way. If you were only asked the question, what's the probability at the beginning at t equals zero? Okay, then you can just use this term here. However, we can also calculate it in general with time dependence and then later plug in t equals zero. That's valid. So now I'm bringing down my psi of term e to the negative i e1 t over h bar and then e1 ket minus 1 over square root of 2 e to the negative i e2 t over h bar and then e2 ket and then big ol' parenthesis and then magnitude squared. Okay, so I'm going to work within the magnitude squared for now, but I am going to bring out some of these coefficients. So you can see that both of these have a 1 over square root of 3, so I can bring that out front. And both of these have a 1 over square root of 2, so I can bring that out front. Okay, then we have two terms here, two terms here. Foiling will give you four terms. I don't have that much board space. Please feel free to write down all four terms, but some of them are going to cancel. So E1 with E1, that one is going to work, so we're going to write it down. Notice that I've already brought out that 1 over square root of 3. If you struggle to keep track of these things, do it in multiple steps. I'm already almost out of board space. And so we keep that time dependence term, and then we have E1, E1, and that will be 1, but it's nice to actually write it down explicitly so that in the middle of the problem you remember what you've already done. So then if I call that term 1, and I call this term 2, we see that that's in fact going to be E2, inner product with E1, that's going to equal zero. That doesn't contribute. I then come and look at E1 with E2. This would be my third term. But again, I have an inner product of two orthogonal vectors. So that's zero. Doesn't contribute. Uh, right. I've lost track of where I am. Then I have E2 with E2. If you have a pattern of how you foil, that would be good. It would help you from getting lost. My fourth term does actually contribute. And so now we have to be careful, and so I'm going to say minus 2i, because I've already brought out that square root of 3, and, but now here I have negative. So I'm going to just explicitly call this negative 1. I've already brought out that 1 over square root of 2. e to the negative i, e2t, over h bar, and then inner product of e2, e2. Okay, so this quantity with those coefficients, but still magnitude squared. So we know that these inner products are 1. We're, we need to be a little bit careful in the next step. And I'm going to actually bring these out, which means I'm going to have, this just becomes 1 over square root of 6. But if I bring that out, I have to square it. OK. What I am now left with on my inside is e to the negative i e1 t over 
h bar, right? That's this first term. Now, okay, I have negative 2i, but then I have a plus, so that becomes plus 2i e to the negative i e2t over h bar. Magnitude, this marker's not having it, squared. Okay, get out of the way so you can see it a little bit better. So that first term just becomes 1 over 6. Okay, let's think very carefully about what this is. This is where if you've been taking a lot of shortcuts with magnitude squared, you're going to have a problem now. First, let's write down the complex conjugate. So remember, if we call this whole thing z, the first thing I want to write down to get magnitude squared is z star and then z. So that first term, I'm going to take this and I'm going to complex conjugate it. I have an i here, so it becomes e to the positive i e1t over h bar. Okay, so my first term here is complex conjugated. Now my second term, I have two i's. I have to complex conjugate both of them. And it's not some weird calculus thing where you have one term where one's done and one term's the other. No, just complex conjugate both of them. So plus 2i becomes minus 2i. And then e to the minus i becomes plus i. e2, t over h bar. Okay, so that was my complex conjugated term. Then I just take that thing and I write it down again. over h bar, and then plus 2i e to the negative i e to t for h bar. Okay, and I'll get out of the way so you can see that a little bit better. So notice that now I have again two terms multiplied by two terms. Oftentimes when we had complex numbers before, it the kind of middle part would drop out. So you would just get like one term magnitude squared plus the second term magnitude squared. That's not going to happen here. You actually need to write out what all four terms are here because they're not going to cancel in some really pretty way. There, there is going to be simplification, but not necessarily to what you want. So I've run out of board. I'm going to stop here. Uh, from here to the end, it is really just some algebra, but it's that complex algebra. What do you expect? Well, it might be time dependent, right? This is a probability. Now we're getting to these time dependent probabilities. But it is still true that probabilities need to be between 0 and 1, and they need to be real. So when you get to your final answer, doing some algebra from here, it might vary in time, but it needs to be a number between 0 and 1. Pro tip, there are sinusoidal functions like cosine squared and sine squared that in fact vary between 0 and 1 in a time dependent way. So you might see that. So it's okay if the time dependence is there, but it needs to be a real number and you expect it to be 0 and 1. So go ahead and do out that math and check and make sure that's right.